It's a roast ready. So this is called a beef rib 109 roast ready as we purchased it. It has the bone in and you can see the ridges on here from the net. The reason that they put the net on is because this fat cap has been removed and then just placed back on. The primary reason that they do that is so that when you go to bake it, all that fat will render into the meat making it flavorful and delicious. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to fabricate them into a couple of different things. I'm going to show you how to do a standing rib roast. I'm going to show you how to take some, uh, make some steaks. And I'm going to show you how to make uh, heart steaks and remove the scarapelli. The scarapelli is the muscle that goes on the outside. So it'll all make sense as we go into it. The first thing you want to do is just remove this cap. This cap just pulls off like that. And then you're just going to trim that off. Okay. Now, a lot of people will take this cap and throw it right into the trash can. Not me. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to cut it into easier pieces to deal with. And then I'm going to cut the meat off of it. So I'm just going to come in, come in at the corner. Generally the corner with a, a thick piece of meat like this, it's going to give you easier access to cutting that fat off of it. Cut down to the fat. And then generally, once you get it started, you can peel it away from the fat, generally. Alright? So just peel the fat off. In cases like that, just come back and cut it up. So, this, you could use this for satay. It's the cap of the ribeye. Tender, flavorful piece of meat. You could use it for satay, you could use it for stir fry, you could use it for grinding meat, you can use it for everything. But, this is normally thrown away. So that's only one piece of that huge fat cap. We got some meat over here that we're going to come after. You could also, if you're adventurous, take the beef fat and render it. Does anyone know what rendered beef fat is called? It starts with a T, rhymes with shallow. Tallow. Tallow, very good. <laughs> right, so beef tallow is rendered uh, beef fat, and you can use it for frying. That's what made McDonald's french fries taste so amazing. Uh, and then the, the government made them change it because of the, the content of saturated fat. Now, saturated fat, if you're eating anything in moderation, you're not going to have a problem. You generally don't sit down every day and eat two pounds of french fries cooked in saturated fat. I wouldn't recommend it. Right? Okay, so... What I'm looking for is just an easier way to access the fat and trim that off. Is that, is that tend to like the, the, um, the brisole? The brisole? brisole. Uh, it, it's, it, this is pretty tender. You can see that it has a fairly discernible muscle fiber. Right. What I mean by discernible muscle fiber is when you look at the grain of the muscle, you can see, like that's a good one, you can see the grain of the muscle. You can also see that it has pretty good marbling throughout as well. So that marbling, anytime you have a more equal distribution of fat in the meat, it's going to make the meat more tender, more juicy, higher quality. Now you can do like marinated dough on Oh yeah, totally. Totally, man. Uh, I like to skewer meat like that, or you could throw it on there just like this, yeah. and then slice it. Which way would you slice it? Against the grain. Exactly. And you slice it against the grain because Think of a rubber band. Say that we were going to eat a rubber band. You're out in the desert, you're stranded, all you can find is a rubber band. If you chew it, if you just cut it in half and chew the whole thing, you got this long rubber band. But if you cut it into pieces, then you can digest it. Just like a McDonald's shake, right? Slightly edible plastic we were talking about. Yeah, sure. Good. Good talk. Right? So there's some more meat. And then we have meat over here. Right, so you can take the fat off in two ways. You can either cut the meat from the fat or trim the fat from the meat. It's your personal preference. I, I generally, it depends on what I'm doing. What I'm feeling for is, I'm feeling the firmness of the fat. The fat is actually hard. What do we know about saturated fat at room temperature? It's solid, right? When we apply heat to saturated fat, that's when it becomes liquid. And that's why the magic of marbling is so good for us. When we have saturated fat or marbling in meat and we apply heat to it, what happens is the fat renders out of its solid state. So imagine this is a muscle. And in between these blank spaces is the fat. 
When we apply heat to that, what happens is the fat renders out and actually lubricates the individual muscle fibers. And that's why we pay for marbling. All right, so we trim that up. Now, we got this little bit of discoloration. We're going to take that off. So now when we look at this, this is what we salvage from what would normally be trash. Okay? Can you get, can you get, that's still the fat that like, you can add to like ground beef. You can add, yep, you can add that. The fat from, can you grab me a bench scraper, Michael, please? Right now, what we're going to do with this, now you can see it's different now that we've taken that cap off. And what I was doing was, if I'm feeling that fat, you can see there's not a lot of fat there. But here, where it, the whole thing moves, that's because of the fat. The saturated fat is hard at room temperature. Okay? Now, to make a standing rib roast, the first thing we're going to do is remove the feather bones. If this were positioned on the animal, it would be on the animal like this. Right? This is the feather bone, which comes up. This is the, if you're giving someone a massage and you feel the bumps down the middle of their back, those are the bones that you're feeling, called the feather bones. Right? So the other rib I would be over here, because it's just half. Now, the other cool thing that we can look at this and tell is which end is close to the chuck. The chuck is going to have a lot more connective tissue and fat in it, right? And the rib is going to be shorter. If you were to look at this end, this end would be going into the short loin, right? So the rib is longer and there is less fat and less connective tissue, okay? Now, if someone said, say you run into a butcher shop and they come into your butcher shop and they say, I want a ribeye steak cut from the chuck end. What would be the advantage of getting a ribeye steak from the chuck end? What do we know about connective tissue? More, uh, Not necessarily more tender, more flavor because of its, its proximity or location to connective tissue. Right? We think about the chuck. Lots of flavor, but lots of connective tissue. So what I'm doing is I'm coming down right behind the feather bone. And I'm just letting gravity assist me. Sometimes it does that. Sometimes on the weekends, not so much. So then we're going to just keep pushing that down. And then fold that up. Right? So basically what they've done is they've run it on the bandsaw, and then they came back and they cut this part out called the chine bone. The chine bone is the center of the spinal column. So again, let's go back to how it would be positioned. So if it were in the animal, it would be positioned like this. Okay? And then you have this bone in the middle, which is hollow, that holds the spinal cord. That is what the feather bones come off of, and the ribs as well. But to make it easier to cut, we want to take this off. So these are the feather bones. And then I like to make the bones smaller when we put them on the, the uh, tray, because if you're putting it in a stock pot, you want it to be able to fit in the stock pot. Right here, right, right. Now, we're going to fabricate the chuck end into a standing rib roast, and then we're going to make some steaks out of the tail end, right? Now, which end is towards the chuck again? Who can remember that? The end with the shorter rib, right? See the longer rib? And what number of ribs are these? Six through 12, right? The 13th rib is in the short loin, and ribs number one through five are in the chuck, right? So you got chuck, ribeye, short loin, sirloin, so we're looking at the side of beef, it would easily fill this entire table. Okay? So we're going to come in, we're going to do a two-bone standing rib roast. Generally, what you want to think about is one rib feeds two people if you're doing a rib roast. Thinking about a standing rib roast. Give me that one of those butcher knives from up top. Thank you, so that know. Right, so we're going to cut down between the ribs. I'm going to spin it around so I can cut it a little bit easier. Now what happens is I've come to a little bit of the residual chine bone, so I'm going to take it to the end, and then I can cut it a little bit easier. And just cut that out, just as easy as that. So can you use those bones to use the veal bones to make it to the Yeah, yes. Now, the reason that you would use veal bones over beef bones for making like a demi glass. Who, who has a, a hypothesis as to why you would do that? Exactly. A younger animal that has less calcium in the interior of the bones and more collagen. What did we learn about collagen yesterday? 
collagen breaks down with the addition of heat. So if you have calcium, it doesn't matter how long you cook that, that bone's still gonna be a bone in the end. If you take a hollow bone that's filled with collagen and you cook it down, you're gonna remove that collagen from the interior of the bone, and that's what's gonna give you the viscosity, okay? So now we can look at this end. You can see all that connected tissue in there. It looks nice and pretty, right? So when we look at this, this is called the heart stake or the heart of the ribeye, and this muscle that comes on the outside is called the scarapelli. On a standing rib roast, we're gonna leave it all together, right? Now you're thinking standing rib roast, just put it in the oven, right? But we wanna make it as easy for our consumer, our guests to eat as possible. So we're gonna take that and we're gonna remove it from the rib. We're gonna stand it upright. We're gonna follow down the ribs. So I pull that back as I cut. Each time I cut, I pull it back a little bit. See how it generally stays back? What's, what's causing that to happen? Gravity and the fat, right? The saturated fat. So we're gonna take that down, cut it off. To remove that. So now we've got this funky piece that's just chilling right here. Now, what we got here is these two little buttons. See how this bone moves? We want to take those out so that when we go to eat the ribs, it's going to make it easier to eat. So we're going to come in. We're going to switch to the OJ hold and come in and remove that button. Right, the OJ. Um, we can only say that because he was innocent for that particular crime, so we got it. Right. Right. <laughs> so this one, what happens is the, the ends of the ribs are not actually fused to the spinal column. They're actually connected by a thin button. When you think about your femur or your humerus, it's connected by a ball and socket, which provides mobility. So a ball and socket, you have the ball of the bone, and then a socket, which holds that in. A button is where you basically have half of that bone in there because it doesn't need to flex around, but if you've ever been in a car accident or if you've ever given someone a really big squeeze of a hug, you can feel their ribs compress. It's not because they're breaking, it's because they're actually just moving a little bit in there. So it provides you flexibility so that you don't totally mess yourself up. So I put my thumb on there to press it down, use the OJ, and as I press, you can see that bone moving back, All right? So I want to pull that out, right? And that goes to my bone pile. So now these are roast ready. And what I mean by that is after I roast them, I could take them off, I could throw them on the grill to finish them, and then I could cut in between each rib. I also want to get this, this uh, connected tissue on the inside off. Now, this is a connective tissue that connects muscle to bone. What kind of connect you, connective tissue connects muscle to bone? Elastin, exactly. There's two types of silver skin, elastin and reticulin. This is elastin. It's kind of elastic in nature. Ligaments and tendons connects muscle to bone. We put those into stock. Why do we think we would put them into stock? Because they make a good stock and they will throw a percentage of protein into the stock. You paid for it, right? So why not use it in your stock? It's more easily broken down into your stock as collagen than something like a bone. So, so, can, and, yep. so you can, can you throw that too many in me? I put, I put silver skin into all my stocks. Because um, the more the more collagen producing or the more uh, protein producing stuff I have in there, the greater my chance of getting a better stock is. The other cool thing you get out of the, the, uh, the ribeye is something called the back strap. And the back strap runs down along the back of the spine. The back strap is responsible for actually helping to hold the head upright. And it's kind of this, uh, I always think of it as like a banana gum colored. It doesn't taste like banana gum, but it's kind of that banana bubblicious color. Right? Where did that come from? That comes from the back of the spinal column. Right? So that goes into my, my bone pile as well. So now I've got my bones cleaned up. They're ready for, for doing my next step. Now I want to take this rib roast and I want to clean it up a little bit. I just want to remove some of the excess fat. So I'm going to feel where I have firm fat. I'm going to come in. I'm going to remove excess fat to my fat pile. I'm going to trim this lip up a little bit, not, not totally, because I don't want to take all the weight off because then that's going to jeopardize the integrity of my yield and my potential for profit. So I'm going to take it, I'm going to fold it like this, look at how much fat we have up here, trim a little bit off. 
What if I were wrapping this in additional fat? What would that be called? Barding, right? Barding. If I took a larding needle larding, larding. and I ran through it, then that would be Barding. larding. Okay. Now I'm going to take that and I'm going to strap it on to the bones, that is. Is that a rope? That's a roast by itself. This is a rope, yep. So this is going to be our standing rib roast. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to take our, tr our uh, butcher's twine, lay it down on the table, put that right in the middle, and I always start in the middle. I'm going to come over, I'm going to put it in the first crease of my finger, I'm going to make a slip knot. Can you see that on there? Okay. And then I'm going to take this string, pull it up through my fingers, pull it through, and tie that off. So that makes a slip knot. Then I return the string to this spot. Okay. Then with my lead string, I'm going to go thumb to finger and twist to make a loop, and then pull that string through there. That makes my knots tied off. A little different method of trussing, but one that works quite well. Yep, so I'll show you again. Okay, so we're going to take it like this. Right, so I'm going to have the, my lead string goes in my hand like this, like I'm shooting the rubber band at my, my brother. Right, so I have the rubber band here and I peek. Right, so I put the string here. Then I'm going to take this little section of string, put it in the crease of my finger, put my hand on the table. I'm going to turn it around, which makes a loop. I'm going to come all the way up. Open up these two fingers like I'm giving you the peace sign. I'm going to take this string around to the front, pinch it through here, pull it up, pull it tight so it's nice and tight on the meat. This string returns to the same position. Take my left hand, I know, I know that because it's an L, right? So L, make a loop, pull it through, boom. And then because it's a large monster of a piece of meat, we're going to put one this way. Sometimes that'll happen. Bad, bad string. So, I had a premature slipulation. So we gotta fix that. So, we'll do that again. So we come in here like this, we go like that. Come in here like this, go like that. Pull it here, just like that. Cinch it up, boom, boom, boom. Done. So there's our standing rib roast, ready to go. Okay. The beauty of this is, what's the benefit of cooking meat on the bone? More moisture, flavor, plus it's raising it up. All exactly. So it's basically like a built-in roasting rack, right? That when we cook it, all that flavor is going to go into the bones, and the bones are also going to contribute flavor as well. So after we're done cooking it, we just cut the strings, lift it off, slice it, we're ready to go. Okay? And then we have the benefit of eating those bones as well. Like, for me, my family, like, we like to eat this from to uh, holiday time. We like to stuff. Yep. And, you know, yeah, or seasoning. Stuff. Like in, in a butcher shop, I generally have a magical seasoning mix, and I would put, rub that all over the ribs, and then put it together, and then yeah. that sells it. Always wants the bottom piece. He wants the bone piece. Yeah, the bone is tasty. All right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna fabricate these two back ribs for barbecue, and we're gonna take the scarapelli off and make heart steaks. So we're gonna continue on coming down the ribs. So pull it back so you can see it. Angle into the bones, right? When in doubt, cut the bone. Don't cut the meat. Meat's expensive, bones are cheap. Unless it's your own bones. And then, right, so now what I'm doing is I'm taking my fingers and I'm prying it apart, like the jaws of life. As I cut it, I pull it apart so that I let that, so I can see it a little bit more clearly. Keep angling into the bones as you cut down. All right, pull it down. See how gravity, gravity's my friend. You'll see butchers, they'll be like in there with their elbows. <laughs> crazy. So, these are our back ribs that we're gonna use for barbecue. I'll come back to those in a second. Okay? So what we're going to do here is we're going to trim these up. We're going to remove the scarapelli. 
on this end, you can't really see the scarapelli. What you see is sometimes you see this piece right here. They call this a nerve. It's not a nerve. It's a tendon. And the tendon runs down the length of that muscle. Um, and in a New York strip, at the tail end of that, it becomes a huge problem. Okay. So on this end, which end, which end was closer to the chuck? This end or this end? This end, right? But you said chuck is smaller. The end. The chuck, the chuck has a smaller eye and more connected tissue. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the scarapelli. When you look at the scarapelli, this is the scarapelli right here, and this is the heart muscle. So we're going to come in underneath here, and what connective tissue allows me to seam the, seam the muscle out like this? It starts with an R. Reticulin, good. So reticulin connects muscle to muscle or fat to muscle. And it is what allows us to distinguish the different groupings of muscles. Now, when I get into this portion, I'm cutting into some elastin because that's where it's connected into the bone. But for the most part, when in doubt, just follow the natural seams. So you can see I'm not, not cutting a lot. Now, most people would look at this and go, oh my god, what are you doing to that ribeye? Sacrilege. Right? But what I'm thinking about is how we're going to use these in the classroom and how I can increase what I know about a ribeye to increase my utilization. So this is going to give me, now, when people get a ribeye, think about how that was constructed initially. We had that big chunk of fat on there that most people want to take off. You can see the, the chunk of fat here, that chunk of fat. Now, a lot of times people say, I want that chunk of fat removed, but we know that as it renders, it's going to add flavor to our stuff. So we're going to cut that out. So now that we've gotten a leaner, a little bit sexier looking steak, because everyone wants sexy meat, right? Yeah. That's right. And you can see, see how firm and thick that fat is? Yes, Chef, good. Good yes, right, Thank you. All right, so we're going to cut that fat off so that it's nice and clean. And so now we have a nice muscle for cutting into steaks. Now, I want to cut that, that lip off as well. You can see that there's a, a good amount of fat on the end here, but on here it's different, right? The fat comes down differently. So I'm going to look at where that is. I'm going to make a little C cut. So I make a C cut on the lip here. I'm going to make a C cut on the lip here. So now I'm going to C, like the letter C. And then I'm going to connect the dots. Now, would I take this lip and throw it away? No, but a lot of people would. But you can see the meat in here. We come back and trim that meat out. Good stuff. Come back to that. Now we're going to come in at an angle and just trim a little bit of that off. And I'm trimming it because I know that I'm not hitting any meat. So I just trim a little bit of that fat off so that it, that comes off. We're going to come back to our scarabelli in a second. All right, so now I've got this. It's ready to cut into steaks. Before I cut any large piece of meat into steaks, I kind of firm it up. So I pull it all together so that it's easier to cut. So now I pull it together. Now I'm going to use my steak knife. I'm going to cut it into steaks. I want to cut the steaks a little bit thicker because it's going to give me a better looking steak in the end, right? And a thicker steak is, is better to teach someone how to cook a piece of meat. Right? A thin steak is going to go from good to bad in a matter of seconds. A thick steak allows you to really work understanding how temperatures are developed. So we cut a thicker steak. And the beauty of this is, in the heart steak, is it's still a decent sized steak, but if it had that scarapelli on it, it would be a good two inches thicker all the way around. So now it's a little bit easier. On the plate, it's going to look a lot nicer, right? Now, you see that fat on there and you're thinking, oh my god, I don't, that's craziness. But, see this piece right here? When you're grilling it, this is the part that generally falls off on the grill and that you eat and it's freakishly delicious, right? So like Lucky Charms, it's freakishly delicious. So you're going to cut that fat off, but each steak is going to yield that fat a little bit differently, and even from top to bottom. So you can look at that. So what we're doing is we're crafting steaks. We're cutting steaks individually as opposed to cutting that whole lip off and cutting steaks blindly. So we're increasing our yield substantially through understanding what we're getting into. So again, we're just going to turn it so that we can increase the yield on that little chunk there. 
We're going to flip it over and see what the back side looks like. Do the same thing there. Trim it down. Lay it out. All right, so I always cut it and lay it out. That's just the habit of uh, working in a butcher shop because you always lay it out on a tray in the order that you cut it so that people know you're honestly cutting the meat for them. Something sexy about it. Sexy Ribeye? Yeah. It's the name of my next band, Sexy Ribeye. <laughs> now, the fat is getting a little bit larger. Now, we can get to this. I was in a butcher shop, I would actually trim this fat down so that it's not like a door wedge. And I would leave this as one big steak. Right, because inevitably you're gonna have someone to come in and say, I'm feeding a couple guests today, so I wanna do something big and impressive. So I'm like, ah, oh, here you go. Here's a ribeye, freakishly large ribeye heart. So, and then what they would probably say was, can you take this out? So I'd just come back and I'd come in and take that connective tissue out. Okay, okay. my question with like, like beef, like you today, because it's mostly corn fed, it's not really that good without taking like all the fat off, it's kind of, it's kind of tough, it's tough. It's tough. Mm -hmm. So I'd take that silver skin off, and now you get this nice looking steak, right? And then uh, maybe I would truss it so that it comes in a little bit nicer. And now you've got a nice big steak there. So we're going to use that as one roast. Uh, just because people don't like the look of the fat on there, so we take that off there. And then I would trim the steaks up, like we talked about. Trim the excess fat off from both sides. Are you guys going to go cook those wings? Uh, we're out of breadcrumbs. Oh. Just, yeah, just go with what we got. Let's trade out a, a sheet pan, we'll get another sheet pan. 